Okay, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Bill Scott, for the record. My eldest son, Eric Scott, might be alive today if Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department officers had been required to wear body cameras in the summer of 2010. Why? Because body cameras are a powerful deterrent to use of deadly force. They literally are unimpeachable witnesses. Officer William Mosier, who panicked and shot my son as Eric and his girlfriend calmly walked out of Costco Summerlin, had already killed one man in his first five years on the Las Vegas Metro Force. That shooting was ruled justified. With no et video evidence or civilian witnesses, inquest jurors had no alternative but to accept the accounts of on-scene police officers, even though they were highly suspect. If you'd been wearing a body camera on July 10, 2010, Officer Mosier might not have fired at Eric. Having narrowly escaped criminal charges before, Mosier might have asked himself, as he hovered near the door of Costco, shaken like the proverbial leaf, according to witnesses, if I shoot and kill again, will I be fired? Will criminal charges be filed against me? With his and dozens of other bo cops' body cameras documenting every move, there would be no escaping the truth this time. Body cameras on Mosier, Thomas Mendiola, and Jason Stark, the three shooters, who fired seven rounds into Eric, including five in my son's back, might have motivated the officers to opt for a much different life-saving tactic. Follow Eric into the parking lot, de-escalate the situation by calmly talking to him, check his legal concealed carry permit, and everybody would have gone home safely, and Eric Scott would be alive and well today. That was almost five years ago when body cams were relatively new. Today, cameras are ubiquitous. Fixed-based cameras monitor street intersections, government facilities, retail stores, homes, and offices throughout America. Additionally, most citizens now carry camera-equipped cell phones and are increasingly quick to film any interaction between police officers and civilians. There's a very high probability that an officer's actions will be captured on video. A professional, honorable police officers have been willing early adopters because they don't fear body cams. Smart police officers readily accept a reliable, high-quality body cam as just part of their essential gear because it's a tool of protection. A body cam ensures events are captured close up and can be reviewed from the officer's perspective. Video and audio records will back up their version of an an encounter and ensure far fewer complaints are lodged by citizens. Body cams also document heroic actions, such as a recent case of a cop rescuing a child from a burning home. Finally, experience validates that cameras often deter criminals from mouthing off or attacking officers because even bad guys realize they can't hide from the, that unflinching camera's eye. Now, dash cameras and police cars and body cams on officers also are restoring balance and fairness to officer-citizen interactions. That balance and fairness were, des uh, were destroyed by the Supreme Court in 1989 when an, quote, objective reasonableness, unquote, standard was imposed by the court's ruling in Graham v. Connor. That case essentially gave police officers a get-out-of-jail-free card a guarantee that they'd never be held accountable for using excessive force. An officer merely had to claim, I felt threatened, or I feared for my safety and that of others, and he'd be exonerated for killing a person. Deadly, unintended consequences of that 1989 Supreme Court ruling, exacerbated by inane qualified immunity laws, tipped the scales of justice firmly in favor of police officers. So for the last 26 years, Cops have been free to brutalize and kill, assured that they would never be held accountable or face criminal charges for actions that resulted in death. Further, taxpayers are always stuck with paying lawsuit judgments. Literally, there was no longer a downside to shooting and killing. Consequently, thousands of Americans have been killed by quick-to-shoot cops who rarely face criminal charges. They have an indisputable James Bond 007 license to kill. Some facts. Since 9-11-2001, cops have killed more than 6,000 people, twice as many 
Americans as died on that modern day of infamy. In 2014, officers killed at least 1,101 citizens as documented by killbypolice.net based on official reports and news accounts. Cops are now killing an average of three people per day every day of the year. And as of last Saturday, officers already had killed at least 280 people this year across the nation. Since May 1st, 2013, at least 2,146 people have lost their lives at the hands of police officers. So obviously we citizens can no longer count on the law and officers' compassion for human life to deter cops from shooting and killing. The Graham versus Connor ruling drastically altered the culture of U.S. policing. In addition, cops are trained to be fearful, to assume everybody they encounter is a threat to shoot quickly because the officer's safety now trumps a citizen's right to live. Cops now have three mantras pounded into their heads at the academy and on a daily basis. One, do whatever you have to, make sure you go home at night. Two, shoot first, don't hesitate. Three, it's better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. But body cams are starting to rebalance the citizen versus cop equation Cameras level the playing field because they're both deterrent and protection. It's slow, but body cams are starting to roll back the unfair advantages imposed by Graham versus Connor. Officers are less likely to use excessive force, and citizens tend to behave better when being filmed. For example, when cops are required to wear body cams in Rialto, California, complaints against officers dropped 88% and use of force incidents declined 60%. Relying on police officers' honor to record incidents and properly handle video and audio data captured by body cams would be naive, though. Outlaw cops, which good officers claim constitute 25 to 30 percent of a police force in some cities, have destroyed the entire law enforcement community's credibility. Body cams alone won't cure that problem because rogue cops will circumvent video and audio evidence. For example, independent analysis of a six-month body cam pilot program in Denver last year confirmed that 75% of use of force incidents were not captured on video. Officers claimed they forgot or didn't have time to turn the cameras on or that the devices malfunctioned. Consequently, stringent measures must be imposed to prevent tampering with and destroying camera data. For instance, an outside, non-law enforcement neutral party should download and assess all video and audio data to preserve a credible chain of evidence after an incident. Strong incentives and penalties also must be mandated to ensure cameras are turned on and video data recordings are not corrupted. If I were designing an effective system, a loud shouted command or noise, like a gunshot, might automatically switch a body cam into data streaming mode. All video and audio data would be transmitted in real time to a third party controlled computer system that could not be accessed by anybody in the officer's department. So the body line, bottom line is cameras, body cameras are not a panacea. However, if airtight protocols are backed by strong incentives and disciplinary measures that ensure video data are not disappeared, Body cams definitely can protect police officers, the citizens who interact with cops, and taxpayers who won't have to underwrite massive lawsuit awards. And despite what police unions will claim, there's absolutely no logical, defensible reason to not equip police officers in Nevada with a body camera. The promise that a police officer's body camera will capture impartial, irrefutable video data may serve as the powerful deterrent that saves your life or your child's life. And it just as likely could save a good cop's life and career. Now, I'm not a Nevada resident, but my mission is to stop the killing here and across America. Nothing will heal the hole in my family's hearts created when a frightened cop mistook Eric's Blackberry phone for a firearm. But my goal is to make sure no other family is subjected to the nightmare of a loved one's murder 
as well as the jaw-dropping lies, demonization, and character assassination that invariably follows when a police officers take a civilian's life. Mandating that every officer wear a reliable body camera is a courageous first step to saving precious lives and holding cops accountable. Now at my son's memorial service on July 17, 2010, an elderly man with tears in his eyes shook my hand and choked out these words. Sir, I'm a retired Metro police officer. Those cops murdered your boy. I had to come and tell you that we're not all like the ones who killed him, but our cops are completely out of control. He's right. Almost five years after Eric was shot and killed, death by police officer has become an epidemic and a national disgrace. It's also financially devastating to a state that depends on 40 to 50 million tourists every year. How many will never come to Nevada because they heard about my son's murder? Mandating that body cameras be worn by every Nevada police officer as a condition of employment, backed by robust measures to preserve and protect video data captured by those cameras, will start to bring cops back under the control of their employers, taxpaying citizens. And cameras also will help protect every sworn lawman and send a resounding message that Nevada is cleaning up its act, taking positive measures that will restore honor to what once was an honorable profession, that of peace officer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, is there any questions from the committee? Ms. Neal. Thanks, uh, Chair. So uh, in the bill on um, page three, it is Line six. So what do you envision as being the disciplinary rules um, that would be enforced if they fail to operate the recording device or manipulate it or prematurely erase? Because in the hearing, I, I, I don't know who's coming up, but in Assemblyman Mumford's hearing, they said that they may keep it. Um, I think it was somewhere between 30 and 60 days. I wasn't sure where where that uh, timeline was going. But what do you envision as a disciplinary procedures? Mr. Chair, if I could uh, refer this to uh, Tony Shelton, my policy director. We've done a lot of uh, studying as, what, as far as what other um, agencies are doing and uh, also looked at the DOJ report. So uh, he has the information on that. Uh, Tony Shelton, for the record, uh, through the chair to Assemblywoman Neal. You, um, you don't need to do that. You can just go directly to okay. the, the committee members. Um, are you t you're talking about the length of time that the uh, uh, data is stored? Well, you have uh, there are three prov provisions in here. So the first part of the question is the discipline that you expect or envision that would be appropriate if you fail to operate the device? Well, um, in all honesty, this bill, came, this bill came from LCB 10 minutes before the deadline. So we were unable to get some of the things in there that we wanted to get, and there are gonna be some amendments. I don't know exactly if we can spell out that in the law, if we're gonna try to figure out what we can do as far as the guidelines and things like that. But in all honesty, there has to be some teeth in it. And if there's no teeth in it, it's not going to work. So we're expecting amendments and looking for any kind of suggestions for things like that. Yeah, Mr. Tobridge, and then I've got a question too. Uh, if you guys look to see that this is a two thirds bill and any changes, you know, I don't know what what the total number is going to be at the end with the amendment, but if it's not, then it's going to have to go to Ways and Means. So uh, if maybe when you get done before the end of the day, if you can touch on the amend the the physical note where we can know where we're going to be sending it to, okay? Right, and I, I am also taking into consideration, you had mentioned to me um, changing the, the wordage to enabling, so we're looking into that too. 
Because I think if I understood you correctly, if we make it enabling, that takes away the fiscal note. That's correct. If I understood it correctly. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tilbridge? And, you know, uh, you guys, you need to get up and go grab a donuts over there. There's four boxes. Thanks to my lovely buddy over here, Miss Neal, bought two, too. I didn't know that. So, uh, please, you guys, get them made up. <laughs> I will make sure I coordinate next time so the uh, bunny, the donut bunny or fairy does it right. Okay, and, and I know that I got two boxes coming on Friday. So, you guys, please grab some. Okay, please go ahead. I'll defer my question until after I get a sugar high. No, no I'm not going, not going to do that. Um, I 100% support body camps. Where I start to have questions is Section 4, where we're requiring uh, someone with any or all powers of a police officer to have insurance. I wonder what level of insurance should you have in mind and who's to pay for it? I see it almost equal to that of a medical doctor that's required to have malpractice insurance. You know, right, yeah, and it's kind of expensive. it's kind of along the same line, but um, what brought this to our attention was the, um, the federal agents, and on the federal level, agents have to carry their own uh, liability insurance, and uh, Tony has some uh, data on the insurance um, aspect of the the cost and and because I was surprised to find that because I would have thought the same thing that it was going to be a large amount of uh, a burden for an officer, but um, the, just the liability insurance it's it's not a big ticket item, especially if um, it's never used. Yeah. Assemblyman Trowbridge, um, what we found was the federal government currently uh, pays up to half of that insurance and they max out at $150. Uh, on some of the uh, officer forums, we're finding people that are reporting that they're only paying $7 a month and they're getting up to a million dollars in liability coverage. This only works for officers that, ha that don't have constant claims and payouts. The whole reason behind this is that once an officer starts getting claims and payouts, it's just like a driver. A driver can't drive on the road if he can't be insured. And this is a way to filter out the problem uh, officers that are causing this, costing this taxpayers money. Thank you. Then I would assume that continuing down page three, the subsection six, uh, if an officer is subject to discipline, that officer is responsible for the financial uh, expenses incurred by the department. So that would go back to the insurance, I would assume. Right. And that... Um, yeah. Assemblywoman Shelley Shelton, for the record, to Mr. Trowbridge, that was just, uh, we were trying to think of some deterrence um, to put in there, and that is uh, another part of the bill that we're uh, looking to amend after talking to uh, different agencies and the way that they're uh, set up to run. Thank you very much. Uh, did that answer your question, Mr. Tilbridge? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. Ms. Spiegel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, first and foremost, Mr. Scott, thank you for coming and um, telling us your story. And my condolences to you and your family. Um, I know this has to be very difficult for you. And um, Assemblywoman Shelton, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, I also am, am supportive of body cameras. Um, but I do have a question, and again, it, um, like Mr. Trowbridge, it goes back to Section 4. And I'm wondering if there are any other public employees in Nevada that are required to pay for their own liability insurance versus having their employer pay for it. Assemblywoman Shelton to uh, Assemblywoman Spiegel. That's a very good question, and I knew I would get – we tried to uh, – research every type of aspects, but I did not search other uh, employees as far as that work for the state or uh, any government entities. So I will check into that, though, and uh, let you know. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? It, uh, Ms. Neal, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I had a question 
because your bill is similar to Mumford's and um, and I got the same question on Assemblyman Mumford's bill after the fact. Um, I had a constituent ask me who is in, they have a son who's a police officer and they wanted to know, is the cost of the camera going to be built into their uniform cost where they then, they're able to offset some of that cost in the future, but in their taxes, but because they felt it would be a burden if the department wasn't the group that was paying for it and the officer had to come out of pocket and then being reimbursed later. So what what's the setup? Um, there, uh, uh, Tony Shelton for the record, there's been a whole bunch of talk about how to finance this. We haven't had any discussion about having the officer himself pay for the camera. Um, what we have is what we have been doing is looking through the budget and try to find out where this can be done. For example, I don't know for sure because we couldn't get an up to date, uh, couldn't get an up to date number. But the last number I heard that we could find was that there were seventeen million dollars in the self insurance fund. That just for example, using Metro for example, there's seventeen million dollars there was in their fund that they pay out claims with, with. Uh, uh, Seventeen million dollars sitting in that fund for no purpose except to play, pay out claims. Um, according to Sheriff Lombardo, who was on uh, Ralston last week, he said in order to uh, equip the rest of Metro that's left, it would cost one point one million dollars to to fully implement the camera, the rest of the camera program, and that it would be approximately. $250,000 every year after that for the storage. Just to give you an idea of where their budget is, last year SWAT alone spent $162,000 on ammunition. Their fuel bill for SWAT alone, $251,000. It's all a matter of priorities. When we're hearing about uh, not having enough money to do this or that. It's not that that they don't have enough money. It's that they're using the money in the places where they've put their priorities higher than being accountable to the public. These cameras have come down in cost. We're not talking about uh, uh, you know millions upon millions of dollars to do this anymore at this point. And another way of getting money for these is uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles put out a call to business and private individuals to put cameras on their police officers. They got $1.3 million in five months from private individuals and businesses. And that was enough to take care of a whole bunch of their department. Small town like Greensboro, Greensboro Arkansas, they raised over, they raised $130,000 just by getting businesses to donate and private individuals that was more than a thousand dollars per camera I mean per officer that they raised just from private donations we have in this state a lot of business they're not too big on paying taxes for things that they don't have any say so whatsoever in how it's being spent but our businesses in Nevada are very generous to give when somebody needs something and Metro needs these cameras, they need the, the accountability, they need the transparency, and I believe that our business will step up and help pay for these and take some of the burden off the taxpayer. Neil, did that get your question? I wasn't sure how far I should go with it. I, I'm just curious and not being mean um, have you guys talked to any private businesses to see if they're interested and if they're, you know, who's, who's signing up saying, yes, I'll do this. Um, Shelly and I own a small business and we'll start with $2,000. And I think other businesses will step up. Ms. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, um, Ms. Shelton, for bringing this bill, and for, to you all, too, for your 
testimonies, and um, I'm wondering um, if you, I believe that possibly this cycle that is happening could be coming about because we have officers being shot also. So we're having officers being shot deliberately for no apparent reason. And then we have officers reacting sort of quickly and fast. So I would ask this question if you all have any kind of input as to your thoughts on some type of resolution to training or something. And I would also ask it of any of the folks um, that might be testifying uh, from Metro or the police department. Uh, Shelley Shelton for the record to Assemblywoman Dooling. And I would like to defer that uh, question to Mr. Scott because he ha has already done uh, research in this department along with um, things that are already happening in aviation um, as far as uh, that's concerned. So I'd like to uh, have Mr. Scott address that. For the record, Bill Scott to uh, Ms. Dooling. The, the common narrative is exactly as you said it, that uh, the bad guys, if you will, are more gunned up, it's more dangerous out there, but the facts don't support that historically. Uh, the Atlantic Magazine did an outstanding story last December addressing exactly that type of issue and saying what is going on here. Their con uh, conclusion was it had a lot to do with training. But some of the facts and figures they had in there were astounding. Number one, police officers, we're told, have one of the most dangerous jobs out there. They have to act very quickly, you know, make these decisions in fractions of a second. If you look at the facts, there are like 63 million interactions between police officers and civilians in a year. And if you track down through the, the number of fatalities of officers, um, it comes down e eventually to about 15, one five fatalities officers kill per year by felonious assault. So these are attentional, um, you know, attacks on officers. Most officers are killed in police or in uh, uh, traffic accidents, okay? So you run the numbers all through there and it comes down to an officer's probability of being killed on the job intentionally by these bad guys comes out to be eight one hundred thousandth of a percent. So the op officer has a pretty good chance of going home at night. Now I can relate to, to flight test. I spent 12 years flight testing airplanes and 35 years ago this Friday, I had to jump out of an airplane that crashed. And while I was in a parachute, I saw a pilot fall to his death, okay? We had very, very little time to act. We were out of altitude and ideas. I got out at 1,000 feet. But there's always time, believe it or not, even in a police officer's incident, um, to stop and think. And that thought, a lot of thinking can happen in one second, okay, to decide, shoot, don't shoot. You know, is there a real danger there? Is there another op uh, option? It comes back to training. Unfortunately, academies now are training people to be afraid. So these cadets hit the streets and they're scared, st scared stiff. Talk to the old officers that are out there, even in Las Vegas Metro, and what will they tell you? So they're more scared of the young guys than they are of the of the bad guys out there. And there's one other factor that there's not a lot of data to support, but I see it anecdotally over and over. We now have a generation of officers, the newer ones, what are called the 13ers. The 13ers are the 13th generation of Americans, and they're a different breed, totally different breed. They're the first generation raised on video games. So many of these officers out there have in a virtual sense, been shooting and killing everything from aliens and bad guys since they were six years old. According to psychological researchers, they have literally wired their brains to shoot first, quickly. That's why we see them going to the lethal end of the spectrum so quickly. Hope that answered your question, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, 